There was a pauper's burial that week in Raveloe, and up Kent Yard at Batherley it was known that the dark-haired woman with the fair child, who had lately come to lodge there, was gone away again. That was all the express note taken that Molly had disappeared from the eyes of men. But the unwept death, which to the general lot seemed as trivial as the summer shed leaf, was charged with the force of destiny to certain human lives that we know of, shaping their joys and sorrows even to the end. Silas Marner's determination to keep the tramp's child was matter of hardly less surprise and iterated talk in the village than the robbery of his money. That softening of feeling towards him which dated from his misfortune, that merging of suspicion and dislike in a rather contemptuous pity for him as lone and crazy, was now accompanied with a more active sympathy, especially amongst the women. Notable mothers, who knew what it was to keep children whole and sweet, lazy mothers, who knew what it was to be interrupted in folding their arms and scratching their elbows by the mischievous propensities of children, just firm on their legs, were equally interested in conjecturing how a lone man would manage with a two-year-old child on his hands, and were equally ready with their suggestions the notable chiefly telling him what he had better do, and the lazy ones being emphatic in telling him what he would never be able to do. Among the notable mothers Dolly Winthrop was the one whose neighbourly offices were the most acceptable to Marner, for they were rendered without any show of bustling instruction. Silas had shown her the half-guinea given to him by Godfrey, and asked her what should be done about getting some clothes for the child. Eh, Master Marner! said Dolly. There's no call to buy no more nor a pair of shoes, for I've got the little petticoats as Aaron wore five years ago, and it's ill spending the money on them baby clothes, for the child'll grow like the grass in May, bless it, that it will. And the same day Dolly brought her bundle, and displayed to Marner, one by one, the tiny garments in their due order of succession, most of them patched and darned, but clean and neat as fresh-sprung herbs. This was the introduction to a great ceremony with soap and water, from which Baby came out in a new beauty, and sat on Dolly's knee, handling her toes and chuckling, and patting her palms together with an air of having made several discoveries about herself, which she communicated by alternate sounds of gog, 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 and mammy. The mammy was not a cry of need or uneasiness. Baby had been used to utter it without expecting either tender sound or touch to follow. Anybody would think the angels in heaven couldn't be prettier," said Dolly, rubbing the golden curls and kissing them. And to think of its being covered with them dirty rags, and the poor mother froze to death. But there's them as took care of it and brought it to your door, Master Marner. The door was open and it walked in over the snow like as if it had been a little starved robin. Didn't you say the door was open? Yes said Silas meditatively. Uh, yes, the door was open. The money's gone I don't know where, and this came from I don't know where. He had not mentioned to any one his unconsciousness of the child's entrance, shrinking from questions which might lead to the fact he himself suspected, namely that he had been in one of his trances. Ah, said Dolly with soothing gravity, it's like the night and the morning and the sleepin' and the wakin' and the rain and the harvest. One goes and the other comes, and we know nothin' how nor where. We may strive and scrat and fend, but it's little we can do after all. The big things come and go with no strivin' o' our own. They do, that they do. And I think you're in the right on it to keep the little un, Master Marner, seein' as it's been sent to you, though there's folks as thinks different. You'll happen be a bit moithered with it while it's so little, but I'll come and welcome and see to it for you. I've a bit of time to spare most days, for when one gets up be times of the morning, the clock seems to stand still toward ten, before it's time to go about the victual. So, as I say, I'll come and see to the child for you, and welcome. Thank you, kindly, said Silas, hesitating a little. I'll be glad if you'll tell me things, but— he added uneasily, leaning forward to look at Baby with some jealousy, as she was resting her head backward against Dolly's arm and eyeing him contentedly from a distance. But 
I want to do things for it myself, else it may get fond of somebody else and not fond of me. I've been used to fend it for myself in the house. I can learn. I can learn. Eh, hey, to be sure, said Dolly gently. I've seen men as are wonderful handy with children. The men are awkward and contrary mostly, God help em, but when the drink's out of em they aren't unsensible. Though they're bad for leeching and bandaging, so fiery and impatient. You see, this goes first next to the skin, proceeded Dolly, taking up the little shirt and putting it on. Yes, said Marner docilely, bringing his eyes very close so that they might be initiated in the mysteries. Whereupon Baby seized his head with both her small arms and put her lips against his face with purring noises. See there, said Dolly with a woman's tender tact, she's fondest of you. She wants to go to your lap, I'll be bound. Go then, take her, Master Marner, you can put the things on, and then you can say as you've done for her from the first of her coming to you. Marner took her on his lap, trembling with an emotion mysterious to himself, at something unknown dawning on his life. Thought and feeling were so confused within him that if he had tried to give them utterance he could only have said that the child was come instead of the gold that the gold had turned into the child. He took the garments from Dolly and put them on under her teaching, interrupted, of course, by baby's gymnastics. "'There, then. Why, you make it quite easy, Master Marner,' said Dolly. "'But what should you do when you're forced to sit in your loom? For she'll get busier and mischievouser every day. She will, bless her. It's lucky you've got that high hearth instead of a grate for that keeps the fire more out of her reach. But if you've got anything as can be spilt or broke, or as is fit to cut her fingers off, she'll be at it, and it is but right you should know." Silas meditated a little while in some perplexity. "'I'll tie her to the leg of the loom,' he said at last. "'Tie her with a good long strip of something.' "'Well, mayhap that'll do as it's a little girl, for they're easier persuaded to sit in one place nor the lads. I know what the lads are, for I've had four. Four I've had, God knows. And if you was to take em and tie em up, they'd make a fightin' and a cryin' as if you was ringin' the pigs. But I'll bring you my little chair, and some bits of red rag and things for her to play with. And she'll sit and chatter to them, as if they was alive. Eh, if it wasn't a sin to the lads to wish em made different, bless em, I should have been glad for one of em to be a little girl. And to think as I could have taught her to scour and mend and the knitting and everything. But I can teach em to this little one, Master Marner, when she gets old enough. But she'll be my little un, said Marner, rather hastily. She'll be nobody else's. No, to be sure, you'll have a right to her if you're a father to her and bring her up according. But, added Dolly, coming to a point which she had determined beforehand to touch upon, you must bring her up like christened folks' children, and take her to church, and let her learn the catechise as my little Aaron can say off, the I believe and everything, and hurt nobody by word or deed, as well as if he was the clerk. That's what you must do, Master Marner, if you do the right thing by the orphan child. Marner's pale face flushed suddenly under a new anxiety. His mind was too busy trying to give some definite bearing to Dolly's words for him to think of answering her. And it's my belief, she went on, as the poor little creature has never been christened, and it's nothing but right as the parson should be spoke to. And if you was no ways unwilling, I'd talk to Mr. Macy about it this very day. For if the child ever went any ways wrong, and you hadn't done your part by it, Master Marner, inoculation and everything to save it from harm, it'd be a thorn in your bed for ever at this side of the grave. And I can't think as it'd be easy lying down for anybody when they'd got to another world, if they hadn't done their part by the helpless children as come without their own asking. Dolly herself was disposed to be silent for some time now, for she had spoken from the depths of her own simple belief, and was much concerned to know whether her words would produce the desired effect upon Silas. He was puzzled and anxious, for Dolly's word, christened, conveyed no distinct meaning to him. He had only heard of baptism, and had only seen the baptism of grown-up men and women. 
"'What is it you mean by christened?' he said at last, timidly. "'Won't folks be good to her without it?' Oh, "'Dear, dear, Master Marner,' said Dolly, with gentle distress and compassion, "'had you never no father nor mother as taught you to say your prayers, and as there's good words and good things to keep us from harm?' "'Yes,' said Silas, in a low voice. "'I know a deal about that. I used to, used to. But your ways are different. My country was a good way off.' He paused a few moments, and then added more decidedly, "'But I want to do everything as can be done for the child. And whatever's right for it in this country, and you think it'll do her good, I'll act accordingly, if you'll tell me.' "'Well, then, Master Marner,' said Dolly, inwardly rejoiced, "'I'll ask Mr. Macy to speak to the parson about it. And you must fix on a name for it, because it must have a name give it when it's christened.' "'My mother's name was Hepzibah, said Silas, and my little sister was named after her. Hey, "'That's a hard name,' said Dolly. "'I partly think it isn't a christened name.' "'It's a Bible name,' said Silas, old ideas recurring. Oh, "'Then I've no call to speak again it,' said Dolly, rather startled by Silas's knowledge on this head. "'But, you see, I'm no scholar, and I'm slow at catching the words.' My husband says I'm always acting as if I was putting the haft for the handle. That's what he says, for he's very sharp, God bless him. But it was awkward calling your little sister by such a hard name, when you've got nothing big to say like, wasn't it, Master Marner? We called her Eppie, said Silas. Well, if it was no ways wrong to shorten the name, it'd be a deal handier. And so I'll go now, Master Marner and I'll speak about the christening afore dark, and I wish you the best o' luck. And it's my belief as it'll come to you if you do what's right by the orphan child. And there's the inoculation to be seen to. And as to washing its bits of things, you need look to nobody but me, for I can do em with one hand when I've got my suds about. Eh, <laughs> the blessed angel! You let me bring my Aaron one of these days, and he'll show her his little cart as his father made for him, and the black and white pup as he's got a rearin. Baby was christened, the rector deciding that a double baptism was the lesser risk to incur, and on this occasion Silas, making himself as clean and tidy as he could, appeared for the first time within the church, and shared in the observances held sacred by his neighbours. He was quite unable, by means of anything he heard or saw, to identify the Ravelo religion with his old faith. If he could at any time in his previous life have done so, it must have been by the aid of a strong feeling ready to vibrate with sympathy, rather than by a comparison of phrases and ideas. And now, for long years, that feeling had been dormant. He had no distinct idea about the baptism and the church-going except that Dolly had said it was for the good of the child, and in this way, as the weeks grew to months, the child created fresh and fresh links between his life and the lives from which he had hitherto shrunk continually into narrower isolation. Unlike the gold which needed nothing, and must be worshipped in close-locked solitude, which was hidden away from the daylight, was deaf to the song of birds, and started to no human tones, Eppie was a creature of endless claims and ever-growing desires, seeking and loving sunshine, and living sounds, and living movements, making trial of everything with trust in new joy, and stirring the human kindness in all eyes that looked on her. The gold had kept his thoughts in an ever-repeated circle, leading to nothing beyond itself. But Eppie was an object compacted of changes and hopes that forced his thoughts onward and carry them far away from their old eager pacing towards the same blank limit, carry them away to the new things that would come with the coming years, when Eppie would have learned to understand how her father Silas cared for her, and made him look for images of that time in the ties and charities that bound together the families of his neighbours. The gold had asked that he should sit weaving longer and longer deafened and blinded more and more to all things except the monotony of his loom and the repetition of his web. But Eppie called him away from his weaving, and made him think all its pauses a holiday, reawakening his senses with her fresh life, even to the old winter-flies that came crawling forth in the early spring sunshine, 
and warming him into joy because she had joy. And when the sunshine grew strong and lasting so that the buttercups were thick in the meadows, Silas might be seen in the sunny midday or in the late afternoon when the shadows were lengthening under the hedgerows, strolling out with uncovered head to carry Eppie beyond the stone pits to where the flowers grew, till they reached some favourite bank where he could sit down while Eppie toddled to pluck the flowers, and make remarks to the winged things that murmured happily above the bright petals, calling Dad Dad's attention continually by bringing him the flowers. Then she would turn her ear to some sudden bird note, and Silas learned to please her by making signs of hushed stillness, that they might listen for the note to come back again. So that when it came she set up her small back and laughed with gurgling triumph. Sitting on the banks in this way, Silas began to look for the once familiar herbs again, and as the leaves with their unchanged outline and markings lay on his palm, there was a sense of crowding remembrances from which he turned away timidly, taking refuge in Eppie's little world that lay lightly on his enfeebled spirit. As the child's mind was growing into knowledge, his mind was growing into memory. As her life unfolded, his soul, long stupefied in a cold, narrow prison, was unfolding too, and trembling gradually into full consciousness. It was an influence which must gather force with every new year. The tone that stirred Silas's heart grew articulate, and called for more distinct answers. Shapes and sounds grew clearer for Eppie's eyes and ears, and there was more that Dad Dad was imperatively required to notice and account for. Also, by the time Eppie was three years old, she developed a fine capacity for mischief and for devising ingenious ways of being troublesome, which found much exercise, not only for Silas's patience, but for his watchfulness and penetration. Sorely was poor Silas puzzled on such occasions by the incompatible demands of love. Dolly Winthrop told him that punishment was good for Eppie, and that, as for rearing a child without making it tingle a little in soft and safe places now and then, it was not to be done. "'To be sure, there's another thing you might do, Master Marner,' added Dolly meditatively. "'You might shut her up once in the coal-hole. That's what I did wi' Aaron, for I was that silly with the youngest lad as I could never bear to smack him. Not as I could find in my heart to let him stay at the coal-hole more than a minute, but it was enough to collie him all over, so as he must be new-washed and dressed, and it was as good as a rod to him that was.' But I put it upon your conscience, Master Marner, as as one of them you must choose, either smackin or the coal hole, else she'll get so masterful there'll be no hold on her. Silas was impressed with the melancholy truth of this last remark, but his force of mind failed before the only two penal methods opened to him, not because it was painful to him to hurt Eppie, but because he trembled at a moment's contention with her, lest she should love him the less for it. Let even an affectionate Goliath get himself tied to a small tender thing, dreading to hurt it by pulling, and dreading still more to snap the cord, and which of the two, pray, will be master. It was clear that Eppie, with her short toddling steps, must lead Father Silas a pretty dance on any fine morning when circumstances favoured mischief. For example, he had wisely chosen a broad strip of linen as a means of fastening her to his loom when he was busy. It made a broad belt round her waist, and was long enough to allow of her reaching the truckle-bed and sitting down on it, but not long enough for her to attempt any dangerous climbing. One bright summer's morning Silas had been more engrossed than usual in setting up a new piece of work, an occasion on which his scissors were in requisition. These scissors, owing to a special warning of Dolly's, had been kept carefully out of Eppie's reach but the click of them had had a peculiar attraction for her ear, and watching the results of that click she had derived the philosophical lesson that the same cause would produce the same effect. Silas had seated himself in his loom, and the noise of weaving had begun, but he had left his scissors on a ledge which Eppie's arm was long enough to reach, and now, like a small mouse watching her opportunity, she stole quietly from her corner, secured the scissors, and toddled to the bed again, setting up her back as a mode of concealing the fact. 
She had a distinct intention as to the use of the scissors, and having cut the linen strip in a jagged but effectual manner, in two moments she had run out the open door where the sunshine was inviting her, while poor Silas believed her to be a better child than usual. It was not until he happened to need his scissors that the terrible fact burst upon him. Eppie had run out by herself, had perhaps fallen into the stone pit. Silas, shaken by the worst fear that could have befallen him, rushed out calling, Eppie, and ran eagerly about the unenclosed space, exploring the dry cavities into which she might have fallen, and then gazing with questioning dread at the smooth red surface of the water. The cold drops stood on his brow. How long had she been out? There was one hope, that she had crept through the stile and got into the fields where he habitually took her to stroll. But the grass was high in the meadow, and there was no descrying her if she was there, except by a close search that would be a trespass on Mr. Osgood's crop. Still, that misdemeanour must be committed, and poor Silas, after peering all round the hedgerows, traversed the grass, beginning with perturbed vision to see Eppie behind every group of red sorrel, and to see her moving always farther off as he approached. The meadow was searched in vain and he got over the stile into the next field, looking with dying hope towards a small pond which was now reduced to its summer shallowness, so as to leave a wide margin of good adhesive mud. Here, however, sat Eppie, discoursing cheerfully to her own small boot, which she was using as a bucket to convey the water into a deep hoof-mark, while her little naked foot was planted comfortably on a cushion of olive-green mud. A red-headed calf was observing her with alarmed doubt through the opposite hedge. Here was clearly a case of aberration in a christened child which demanded severe treatment, but Silas, overcome with convulsive joy at finding his treasure again, could do nothing but snatch her up and cover her with half-sobbing kisses. It was not until he had carried her home and had begun to think of the necessary washing that he recollected the need that he should punish Eppie and make her remember. The idea that she might run away again and come to harm gave him unusual resolution, and for the first time he determined to try the coal-hole, a small closet near the hearth. "'Naughty, naughty Eppie,' he suddenly began, holding her on his knee and pointing to her muddy feet and clothes. "'Naughty to cut with the scissors and run away. Eppie must go in the coal-hole for being naughty. Daddy must put her in the coal-hole.' He half expected that this would be shock enough, and that Eppie would begin to cry. But instead of that she began to shake herself on his knee, as if the proposition opened a pleasing novelty. Seeing that he must proceed to extremities, he put her into the coal-hole and held the door closed, with a trembling sense that he was using a strong measure. For a moment there was silence, but then came a little cry. Oppy! Oppy! and Silas let her out again, saying, "'Now, Eppie'll never be naughty again, else she must go in the coal-hole, a black naughty place.' The weaving must stand still a long while this morning, for now Eppie must be washed and have clean clothes on. But it was to be hoped that this punishment would have a lasting effect, and save time in future, though perhaps it would have been better if Eppie had cried more. In half an hour she was clean again, and Silas, having turned his back to see what he could do with the linen band, threw it down again with the reflection that Eppie would be good without fastening for the rest of the morning. He turned round again, and was going to place her in her little chair near the loom, when she peeped out at him with black face and hands again, and said, "'Eppie in the toll-hole!' This total failure of the coal-hole discipline shook Silas's belief in the efficacy of punishment. "'She'd take it all for fun,' he observed to Dolly, "'if I didn't hurt her. And I can't do that, Mrs. Winthrop. If she makes me a bit of trouble I can bear it. And she's got no tricks but what she'll grow out of.' "'Well, that's partly true, Master Marner,' said Dolly sympathetically. And if you can't bring your mind to frighten her off touching things, you must do what you can to keep em out of her way. That's what I do with the pups as the lads are all as a rearin. They will worry and gnaw, worry and gnaw they will, if it was one Sunday cap as hung anywhere so as they could drag it. They know no difference, God help em. It's the pushing of the teeth as sets em on. That's what it is. 
So Eppie was reared without punishment, the burden of her misdeeds being borne vicariously by Father Silas. The stone hut was made a soft nest for her, lined with downy patience, and also in the world that lay beyond the stone hut she knew nothing of frowns and denials. Notwithstanding the difficulty of carrying her and his yarn or linen at the same time, Silas took her with him on most of his journeys to the farmhouses, unwilling to leave her behind at Dolly Winthrop's, who was always ready to take care of her. And little curly-headed Eppie, the weaver's child, became an object of interest at several outlying homesteads as well as in the village. Hitherto he had been treated very much as if he had been a useful gnome or brownie, a queer and unaccountable creature, who must necessarily be looked at with wondering curiosity and repulsion, and with whom one would be glad to make all greetings and bargains as brief as possible, but who must be dealt with in a propitiatory way and occasionally have a present of pork or garden stuff to carry home with him, seeing that without him there was no getting the yarn woven. But now Silas met with open smiling faces and cheerful questioning, as a person whose satisfactions and difficulties could be understood. Everywhere he must sit a little and talk about the child, and words of interest were always ready for him. Ah, Master Marner, you'll be lucky if she takes the measles soon and easy. Or, why, there isn't many lone men that have been wishing to take up with a little un like that. But I reckon the weaving makes you handier than men as do outdoor work. You're partly as handy as a woman, for weaving comes next to spinning. Elderly masters and mistresses, seated observantly in large kitchen armchairs, shook their heads over the difficulties attendant on rearing children felt Eppie's round arms and legs, and pronounced them remarkably firm, and told Silas that if she turned out well, which, however, there was no telling, it would be a fine thing for him to have a steady lass to do for him when he got helpless. Servant maidens were fond of carrying her out to look at the hens and chickens, or to see if any cherries could be shaken down in the orchard, and the small boys and girls approached her slowly, with cautious movement and steady gaze like little dogs face to face with one of their own kind, till attraction had reached the point at which the soft lips were put out for a kiss. No child was afraid of approaching Silas when Eppie was near him. There was no repulsion around him now, either for young or old, for the little child had come to link him once more with the whole world. There was love between him and the child that blent them into one, and there was love between the child and the world from men and women with parental looks and tones, to the red ladybirds and the round pebbles. Silas began now to think of Ravelo life entirely in relation to Eppie. She must have everything that was good in Ravelo, and he listened docilely that he might come to understand better what this life was, from which for fifteen years he had stood aloof as from a strange thing, with which he could have no communion as some man who has a precious plant to which he would give a nurturing home in a new soil thinks of the rain and the sunshine and all influences in relation to his nursling, and asks industriously for all knowledge that will help him to satisfy the wants of the searching roots, or to guard leaf and bud from invading harm. The disposition to hoard had been utterly crushed at the very first by the loss of his long-stored gold. The coins he earned afterwards seemed as irrelevant as stones brought to complete a house suddenly buried by an earthquake. The sense of bereavement was too heavy upon him for the old thrill of satisfaction to arise again at the touch of the newly earned coin. And now something had come to replace his hoard, which gave a growing purpose to the earnings, drawing his hope and joy continually onward beyond the money. In old days there were angels who came and took men by the hand and led them away from the city of destruction. We see no white-winged angels now, but yet men are led away from threatening destruction. A hand is put into theirs, which leads them forth gently towards a calm and bright land, so that they look no more backward, and the hand may be a little child's. End of chapter 14